and uh, she said yes, she would come. And so I'm so blessed and glad to have her here today. Uh, Pastor Donna, of course, uh, hails from uh, 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 North Carolina and uh, married to Dedrick. Many of us know, of course, Dedrick and two children, Kyle and Coltrane. And touch your neighbor. Amen. And we're so blessed and glad that she's here today. So I, I'm going to invite us all to please stand to our feet and let's put our hands together for the spokeswoman for the King of Glory. Amen. Pastor Donna Coltrane Battle. express how incredibly thankful to God I am. Um, and no matter how long I walk with God, it is um, always amazing to me how much God loves me and how much God like keeps proving that God loves me even when I forget that God loves me or I act like I don't know that God loves me. And so I am thankful to God for listening to me and for being my confidant and for always showing up because all of us are kind of shady. Like none of us are consistent, right? I mean, that's what it means to be human. Like, people talk about hypocrisy. We're all hypocrites. I mean, nobody's that consistent, but God is. And so I'm incredibly thankful, and I'm very thankful for the blessing um, of my husband in his absence. Um, that is a man who, despite what we've been through, um, sticks with me and affirms his love for me as we do life together. So, babe, if you're listening, I love you, and I love my babies as well. So I'm thankful. Um, this is home. I'm thankful to my brother, Pastor Mike. I'm thankful to my sister, Pastor Sharice. And to all my friends and family that are in the room, like this really is home for me. And so um, I still talk about the way like we and um, the church where we are a part of now, a really good friend of mine is pastoring. And those of you who knew Dedrick knows that Dedrick um, sung when he was here. He's always been a singer. And so he finally joins the praise team at the new community where we are. And on the first Sunday he sings, he wears the way hat. <laughs> and so, like, I snapshot a picture and send it to, like, Jocelyn and Moses and a few other people. I'm like, he's at the new church wearing the way hat on the first Sunday he is. <laughs> so know that um, you're always loved. So I asked for your prayers in this place. So... Preaching is something I love. I think that's not a, um, a secret. But preaching is also something that is um, very difficult for me. The preparation of preaching is difficult for me. And despite the 16 plus years that I've been doing it, it's always difficult. But sometimes it's more difficult than others. And this happens to be one of those sermons, I think, mostly because um, it speaks directly to a place where I am personally, spiritually. And it's hard sometimes to put our experiences to language because there isn't always language for, for what we have. And so I'm in that place. So I just invite you, one, to be gracious and to have grace with the sister. Uh, <laughs> and two, to know that whatever part of this, if any part of it connects with you, um, I encourage you and I challenge you to grab it, to hold it, to chew it, and to allow God to expand it because God is still expanding some things in me through this word. So I say that to say that this is a very humbling place for me because um, in many ways, I'm thankful that God is using me to bring forth this word, but God is still doing this word in me. So um, let's bow forward a prayer. God, we enter into these spaces and we find ourselves in many different places in life. Some of us came into this place having despaired and cried before we walked into the church. Some of us are kind of on autopilot. Others of us are on cloud nine because we're in the midst of joy. Wherever we are, God, we are thankful that you meet us where that place is. And so, God, for all the things that we have to do, all of the things that we're working through, all the myriad of, of thoughts and emotions that we hold all at once, we ask in this moment, that you silence those voices that continuously speak, that we may hear yours, that we may respond to your voice, that we may be transformed by this word, and that your spirit might do a work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So for some of you, this passage of scripture will be fairly familiar. It is um, found in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. This is the New King James Version, and it reads as follows. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered over them, but there was no breath in them. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Indeed, they say our bones are dry, our hope is lost. And we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. I'm not much of a tweeter. It was about five years after Twitter was created that I actually formed an account, and that was only because my husband had bugged me to form one. And it was another six months after I formed an account before I actually wrote my first tweet. I'm not much of a tweeter, but I remember my first tweet. It was on May 2nd, 2011. Many of you may not remember that day, but that morning I woke up to the news that Osama bin Laden had been killed. And I was caught in this array, this array in this dichotomous place of emotion because I was watching as people celebrated all this justice. And there was a part of me that was relieved at the apparent justice, right? But there was another part of me that was grossly uncomfortable with what appeared to be the celebration of the death of a man, a man who I knew and believed that God loved just as much as me. And I was torn. I was torn in my own kind of personal, you know, crisis in this moment stuck between these two places. You know, I wanted to celebrate justice, but I grieved over the, over the celebration of death. And I felt guilty for grieving over the celebration of death. And I said to myself, I said, well, you know, like, is it that, you know, shouldn't I be happy that the world is a bit safer? And then my mind says, well, is the world safer? You know, I mean, like, don't these sales and, you know, these terrorist groups still exist, not just foreign, but for some of us, domestic? And I said, well, maybe, you know, it's just that, you know, the world is safer, but not the whole world, just my world, America. And then I said, well, can I call America mine? You know, like, as a black woman, 
do I belong here? But if I don't belong here, then where do I belong? Right? So I'm in this mental kind of back and forth. Like, how do I live in an experience where I can experience belonging in the reality of a historical and contextual reality that is so broken and jacked up? Like, how can I experience belonging in the midst of that? Well, here's what my first tweet said. Celebrating justice is one thing. Celebrating the death of, an, of another is something else. We are all equally loved by God, the good and the bad. Now, I was torn around writing this tweet, and quite frankly, I'm probably the only one who read the tweet, maybe other than Dedrick. <laughs> but still, I had to write it, right? I still had to write it because even though I had all of these things going through my mind, I was torn in so many directions. I was so confused. I still had a burning inside of me, and I had to write it. In fact, I rewrote it several times because that's when I discovered that Twitter actually has a character limit. <laughs> so I had to get it all in. So I sat there for about 15 minutes trying to write this. My second tweet came nine months later, and it was a quote by one um, or by my favorite living theologian, and it says this, whenever you study God, you walk away ignorant, by Dr. John Kenny. And it wasn't until I was writing this sermon that I realized the correlation between these two tweets, that we have a God who has created us that loves us so much, that is so great, that is so wonderful, that is so deep, that, is, that does things so far beyond our limited capacity, right? But that, that God still invites us to participate in the redemption of this world, yeah. right? And so we are often pushed into this place where we exist in an emotional and a mental dichotomy, right? So here I am, you know, really wanting to celebrate justice, but simultaneously grieving for the hearts of those good people who celebrate the death of bad people. That I was existing in the midst of joy and sadness at once, excitement and fear. Why is this? It's because we are constantly being called to a higher existence, to a higher intimacy by a God who is great and good and loving and just, but we are still living inside our limitations. Yeah. We're not quite there. And so I believe that this passage today perhaps teaches us a little bit about this phenomenon, this existence, this dichotomy of being trapped between two places that maybe God wants to illuminate for us. The Spirit brings Ezekiel out. Now, that alone will preach, but we're not going to preach that today. Ezekiel is brought out by the Spirit of God, out of his normal place. And he is literally put directly in the middle of a personal pain. You see, this historically, this passage was, um, is correlated with the Chaldean invasion. And so it would have been very um, keen on Ezekiel's mind during this experience that his people had been invaded. He would remember the violence. He would remember the pain. He would remember the slaughter of his people being taken from their homeland and literally scattered. So here, when the spirit brings Ezekiel out, he is placed in the middle of his people and his own pain and misery, misery of being captive to empires and to systems. So he is brought out and he is made to wade through, to walk through this open valley full of dry, desiccated bones. And God says to him, mortal, can these bones live? Amen. Ezekiel's like, Lord God, I don't know. You know. He says, I want you to prophesy to these bones. He says, I want you to say, thus says the Lord, I will 
cause my breath to go into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you. I will put flesh on you and skin on you and cover you and I will breathe into you and you shall live and you will know that I am the Lord. And so Ezekiel does that. Ezekiel prophesies and there's a clattering, a clicking as bone begins to connect to bone, right? The hip bone to the leg bone, the leg bone to the ankle bone as these dry, desiccated bones begin to form into skeletons. And there they lie on the ground, a slaughtered army, dead and formless like zombies. No spirit. No breath. And then God says, okay, now I want you to prophesy to the wind, to the breath. And say, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they might live. And so Ezekiel prophesies, and the northern wind rushes to merge with the southern wind that reaches out to grab the eastern wind that arches over to consume the western wind. And together they heave. One breath breathing life into these dead bodies, recomposed with flesh and tendons and muscles. And then God says to Ezekiel, this is the whole house of Israel. He says, they say, that we are bones and that our bones are dry. They say that our hope is lost and that we are completely cut off. He says, but I want you to prophesy to them. And I want you to tell them that I am going to open up their graves and I am going to cause them to come up out of their graves and I'm going to put my breath in them and they shall live. I'm going to put them back in the land of Israel. I'm going to breathe into them and they will live and then they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act. Ezekiel is brought out by the Spirit and is placed in the midst of his personal pain. How do we make sense of that? How do we make sense of the fact that he is there in the midst of pain because the spirit brought him there? Dr. Paul Brand, before his death, did a lot of work with leprosy. And he said in one of his books that, you know, leprosy patients um, often have their nervous systems impacted. And so they lose the ability to feel pain. He says, but the problem with losing the ability to feel pain is that you can sustain a life-threatening injury and never know you're hurt. He says, pain is what tells us that something's wrong and we need attention. He says, in this way, pain is a gift. Psychologist Dr. Gwen White says that the greatest motivator for change is pain. How do we make sense of the fact that the spirit has placed and brought Ezekiel to a place of personal pain and misery for him and his people. Well, you see, there is a difference in saying that the Spirit brought him to the pain that was already there and already existing and in saying that the Spirit caused it. That sometimes there is pain that is already present that we must come face to face with in order for it to ever have any purpose. And that's what we do with pain, right, y'all? I mean, pain is very intimate. We hide it. We keep it private. We don't want a whole lot of people mixing up in it. And so what do we do? Even it's so intimate sometimes that we don't even want to be close to it. We just avoid it. We avoid pain, but in doing so, we often prolong the painful process. What might it mean For this passage, in this passage, for God to be saying to us that pain can be used as a part of the redemptive process. That pain can become a part of redemption. 
okay, that we need in order to survive. Our breath goes to places inside of us that we will never set eyes on. It's a very intimate experience, right? The, the air I breathe in sometimes is the air you breathe in. And don't be on no airplane. That's why you have to take vitamin C, right? Because that air just recycles. You breathe, breathe it in, add it. Somebody else and breathe it in, right? Yeah, it's intimate. It might sound nasty, but it's intimate. And that that same wind carries, you know, the breath that we breathe um, and the air that we breathe to other animals, right? There's this connection. 60% of our bodies is made up of oxygen. 21% of the atmosphere are oxygen. 46% of the Earth's crust, oxygen. Scientists often consider oxygen to be ubiquitous. And it's not God. The Holy Spirit, ubiquitous, existing everywhere at all times. But perhaps the most important thing is that in most compounds that make up the basic forms of life, that's where oxygen is found. Oxygen is a part of most compounds that sustain basic life. What does that say? It says that where there is oxygen, there is life. <laughs> where there is oxygen, y'all, there is life. And so what we see then is that God has, has freed him, has made him come to, to, um, to grips with the fact that he wants to participate in the salvation of his people, but he doesn't have any control over changing the situation. And so now he's going to use Ezekiel, right, through this process, through this intimate process, through the work of the Spirit, the breathing and the intimacy of the Spirit. I mean, is not the Holy Spirit our comforter? Right? And what do we do when somebody is anxious and all uptight? We've all done it. We've all said it. Just calm down and what? Just breathe. <laughs> right? Just breathe. And so what we see God doing in this passage is utilizing that life force. I mean, what if we too have the capacity to give life in this way? I often have said and believe that, you know, our breath is the mark of the Holy Spirit on creation. What if every time you breathe in, it is a personal and permanent invitation by God to be intimate with God? That this is the mark of the Holy Spirit on creation. One other characteristic of oxygen, is, the oxygen that is so important is that it is overly reactive. It is highly reactive, meaning it is constantly seeking to form bonds with other compounds. In fact, it can form bonds with most compounds on the periodic table, right? Like H2O, it bonds with hydrogen to create water, right? But that there, unless there is this like photosynthetic action of living organisms to recreate oxygen, it's hard for oxygen to just exist because it is almost aggressive in its desire to bond and create new life. <laughs> yeah, you see, you see where I'm going with this, right? It is almost aggressive in that way. What does it mean for 60% of our bodies to be created of oxygen? What does it mean for us to breathe in and breathe out oxygen on a regular basis as a means of our life force? Why is it that we think that what we speak, which requires our breath, does not create life or death? Right? Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And this is what God does. God brings up this life force out of Ezekiel and causes him to speak, to use his breath to give life to the dead. So first, Ezekiel is made to come face to face with the reality that he does not have control. He his pain is utilized in order to create space for power to be used. And the power that God uses is the power that is within him, the very breath of God in him to speak life to death. But I think it's important for us to know that he only participates in the redemption of the people. Participation is an important word. Why? Because where God is, 
we will bear witness to a work beyond us. So it's not just that God creates the space through pain for power to come in to Ezekiel and uses then that power to participate. But then God allows Ezekiel to bear witness to something so far beyond him that is needed in order to complete the process. So when we look at this passage of scripture, a lot of scholars say that um, it is written in this way, right? The desolation, the death right? The bones, these imagery, this imagery is written in this way in order to paint for us how unlikely it was that the Jewish people could be restored and delivered back into one body politic, that they could be pulled from all these scattered places to become one people again. They wanted, he says, you know, the author really wanted to paint that it was very unlikely for this to happen. So what we're talking about here is that what God is doing is nearly impossible, Right. And they want to kind of paint that thing. All right. And so I want you to consider this for just a minute. When you consider reality you're living in and it begins to suffocate you, overwhelm you, depress you and pull you to a place of wanting to quit, then that should trigger something inside you. It should tell you that you are facing what you are facing is not only threat is only threatening to drown you because you have not yet invited God in to handle what you can't. So if you feel like you're drowning and this thing is about to consume you, nine times out of ten, you have blocked God and not invited God in to do what you can't. Right? Now just stick with me for a minute. Just stay with me in this for a minute. So we got Ezekiel here and he's about to bear witness, right? And we remember that life and death is in the power of the tongue. I want you to pay attention to what God says in this passage. He says, this is the whole house of Israel. He says, they say, not I say. He says, they say our bones are dry. They say our hope is lost. They say we have been completely cut off. They have spoken this and they are living in this existence. Now, yes, there is a part of this reality psychologically that what we believe to be true becomes our reality, right? A part of this is about the narrative, right? What do we believe to be true? You know, this is the, the circus elephant who as a baby is tied up by a chain, and no matter how hard he tries to break the chain, he can't, and so he stops trying, but then he becomes an adult, and now he's strong enough to break the chain, but because he believes he can't break the chain, he doesn't try. Right? Like sometimes we believe false narratives about ourselves because we've been taught it. But sometimes we believe a false narrative because it's easier to quit than to embrace the real narrative. Right? Let us not be confused that that was an army in that valley. A dead army has lost the war. But when an army now has breath, that army must keep fighting. Right? So what we're talking about here is life and death in the power of the tongue. They said these things. This is the narrative they had spoken into their existence. We have been cut off. But God names the false narrative and then reminds them of the real narrative. Right? Let me remind you of it. This is it. I will put my spirit within you. And you shall live, and I will place you on your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act. Now, I want you to consider for just a moment where the Israelites were. They were scattered. They were dispersed. A nation without land is no nation at all. What are the implications of being taken from your homeland, held captive, and now no longer knowing where you belong? I mean, the people from where I came from don't claim me. The people where I am don't claim me. So where do I belong? Right? Where do I call home? It can kind of put you in this place of feeling like, mm, nobody's really looking out for my best interests. Just kind of floating through. What are the implications of that? 
What are the implications of feeling homeless in the only home you've ever known? For some of us, this is the state of our people. For some of us, this is the state of your marriage or your relationship. For some of you, this is the state of a relationship between your mama or your daddy, your sister or your brother, your son or your daughter. For some of this, this is your job. You're at the only home you know, but you feel homeless. You feel disconnected. You feel separated. You feel like you just don't belong. And this kind of experience, right, this kind of unaddressed pain can create rifts in our faith. It can create rifts in our faith. What is faith? According to Hebrews, faith is the evidence of things unseen, right? It is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. What I am saying to you all is that the Holy Spirit in this moment is allowing Ezekiel to bear witness to God literally reestablishing his people's faith. Literally. How does this happen? Could it be that as Ezekiel is witnessing all of these things, it is literally becoming the substance of things he will hope for in the future but haven't seen? That it is literally, this experience is becoming the evidence that the things that he wants later in life, but he can't see, that they will happen. Why? Because I've seen God do it before, and I know God will do it again. I mean, you hear these testimonies being named. We are not a people with blind faith. People always talk about blind faith. Our faith ain't blind. You know why? Because time after time after time, the Spirit of God has allowed us to bear witness to what God can and will do. And if you know God has done it once, that's all the evidence I need. You see, this is an important piece because, you see, the reason the elephant stays bound is because he's never seen any other elephant break free. We've got to be in spaces and places like right here. When you hear the testimony, when you begin to name your own, why? Because otherwise, it doesn't matter how much God is saying, I really want to free you from this. You will block God from opening that societal grave. You will block God from opening that psychological grave. You will block God from opening that spiritual grave and bringing you up. You will resist every time because you don't even think it's possible. So being able to bear witness to something beyond us is something we should always practice personally and communally. One of my spiritual mothers once said this. We belong wherever God's creation is. That we don't have to ask permission to experience what our creator created for us. In writing this sermon, what I came to discover is that I'm not trapped in the middle of a dichotomy. I'm not trapped between um, mental and emotional thought. I'm actually called to it. I'm called to it. Why? Because if we pay attention to the end of this scripture right here, it says, I, the Lord, have spoken and will act. Then you shall know. Then, as in after I've done all these things, then, after I've done all these things, you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken spoken and will, that's future act. There is a reestablishing of my faith. So any position I'm in now, I'm not trapped. I'm called to be in this in between. I'm called because I am always pressing towards redemption, always pressing towards healing, always pressing towards life because there is an essence in me that is aggressive in its desire to bond with other people and to create new life. I'm not trapped. I'm not trapped. I am called. And if I am called, then I can always accept that call. Why? Because I don't have to worry about belonging. 
wherever my God is, that's where I belong. And since my God is ubiquitous, since God exists everywhere, I belong right where I am. God exists everywhere, even inside me. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Just sit with it for a minute. Just sit with it for a minute. God often speaks in a still, small voice because power doesn't have to prove itself power doesn't have to be loud doesn't have to convince you of what it is it simply is what it is so let's just be still for a minute what is that part that God has asked you to chew for some of you it might be hard to swallow For others, it may be affirmation. But where have you been almost about to quit? And in this moment, you realize it's because you haven't invited God in to do what you can't. Where have you given up hope and spoke that into whatever situation it is that you really desire to live, but you allowing it to die? What part of that you, a part of you, is longing to bond and belong? Just sit with it, just sit with it. God, your spirit is so powerful. And God, you do a work each and every day, each and every moment, each and every second that is so far beyond us. God, you're so good and you're so just and you're so loving and you're so gracious. But God, our pain is so real. Our limitations And sometimes our hopelessness gets the best of us. But God, you are also faithful in your love for us. You're faithful in providing for us. And so God, we are a few of your people. We are a few of your people saying in this moment right here and right now, we invite you in. We invite you all up in us, those you have created, those you have called, those you have placed where you have placed. We invite you into those situations, God, that we've lost the words of prayer for. We invite you, almighty God, into those miserable, desperate, depressed situations that seem to be so cyclical that we can never just get off the roundabout, never stop running on the treadmill. God, I pray that you stop it and allow us to step off. God, we invite you into the hearts of those people that we've been praying for. We ask you to, we ask you to enter into the parts of our hearts, God, that we hold so intimate that they're even too intimate for us or you to get close to those parts of us that we don't even want you to kiss. God, show us where those places are that you might touch them, that you might heal them. But God, we also ask that you restore to us our proper narrative. Lord, that we will not believe a lie and live by a lie because that means we die. So God, give us the courage to grasp the fact that we are living beings ready and able to fight, ready and able to be emptied, ready and able to be filled with your power, ready and able to be dependent upon you, ready and able to be used, ready and able, almighty God, to wade in our pain so that it can be used for redemptive purposes. 
Remind us that we walk on holy ground. Remind us that we are grace-filled vessels. Remind us that this world that you love and that you are working to redeem, Almighty God, that you invite us, and it's a privilege, that we are invited to walk alongside you. We are invited to extend compassion and love. But God, first we've got to love and have compassion for ourselves. So mend those places, God, as we extend that generosity to the world around us. Lord, where there needs to be forgiveness, give us the courage to forgive. Where there needs to be deliverance, almighty God, give us the courage to kneel in a place to be delivered. Lord, give us what we need that we might be your people. Remind us that we are gifted and that we are made in order to create new life. We are made to form lifelong bonds. We are made to be in community. We are made to belong. Thank you, God. For you are a God who keeps your promises. So name your promises. Remind your people of the promises you have given to them. And may they be energized and restored in their hope. May they be reminded, Almighty God, that you will give them a place to call their own. That we belong to you, God. We are yours. Love us. Keep us. Forgive us. And show us the way. In the name of he who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever, we pray and believe these things to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So perhaps you're here. Perhaps you're here and you say, I, I want to invite God in. But I'm not really sure what this whole Christianity thing is about. It's about this right here. It's about being broken and being jacked up and walking with a whole bunch of other people that know they broken and jacked up and saying, we are trusting the grace of God to teach us how to love each other right. It's about not being alone. It's about not having all the right answers, but being willing to search for them anyway. It's about knowing that God will make a way out of no way because you're sitting beside somebody who God did it for. It's about belonging. So if you've never said, no, I really wanna be a part of this thing. I want Jesus to be a part of my life. If that's you and you're just saying, I wanna do that. My way isn't necessarily to invite you to come up to the front, but I want you to hold that and know that you can see me, you can see Pastor Mike, you can see Sharice, you can see any of the leaders before you leave. And we give you that opportunity, a precious opportunity, to affirm you and say, you're a part of us, whether you know it or not, we claim you. But I also acknowledge that life is complex and hard and difficult. And so some of you have been pressing all week just to get to this moment because you know you need prayer. There is something to be said about being in a community that can pray with you and for you. You don't have to have enough faith. That's why you come here. My faith joins with your faith right? You ain't got to believe it. I believe for you. So we're opening up the space because this is another way that God allows us to participate in the redemption of this world, participate in our own healing, participate in our own way being made. It's through prayer. There is power in prayer. So I invite you, the altar is open. This is a resource. I invite you to come for prayer maybe you're standing on behalf of someone else maybe you're saying I need intercessory prayer the altar is open the altar is omen you're welcome to come
for prayer. Come on, why don't we all stand to our feet and lift those hands to God. Come on, everybody, stand on your feet and lift your hands. Some are coming as just... Thank you.